You're now listening to the Brandon Brand Sports Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Brandon Brand Sports Podcast, episode 13. We're going to do it a little bit different this week and go light on football. Uh, We're going to start out with some NHL. Mike Babcock from the Toronto Maple Leafs, the head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs, has finally got his walking papers after five seasons. Probably the worst kept secret in the league at this point heading into it. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of reports out there or speculation that Kyle Dubas wanted to can the guy in the offseason. Brendan Shanahan vetoed that. He wanted to give it another shot. But there was others. uh, also speculation that Kyle Dubas kind of went... The other way, he said, if, if we're going to keep Babcock, I'm going to take his players away. Not the major ones, but guys like Patty Marlowe, which Mike Babcock adored, chose not to resign him. Obviously, there was cap issues or supposed cap issues, but I, I think Kyle Dubas had another agenda that if he can make him unhappy enough and they did get the the, the negative start, which they did do, that it would be an easy conversation. And obviously it was. The whole thing is just a bit of a weird situation to me. Like, it was pretty clear that Babcock was never Dubas' guy. Um, And he's worked with the new head coach, Sheldon Keefe, Keefe, I don't know how to pronounce that, um, in the OHL with the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds and the AHL with the Marlies. So they've always had the partnership there. But why string Babcock along and then essentially set him up to fail uh, by taking away, like you said, his players? It just doesn't make any sense, especially with the season that they have and all the high expectations that they had. Well, I think there's a public relations thing there. I don't think the fans ever wanted Mike Babcock to go, especially in the off season. I mean, you see the success, the gradual trend upwards in his tenure there. They made the playoffs the last three years, uh, had a record points in a season a couple years ago, and uh, they were making progress. So I think if you can the guy in the summer, the fans are like, well, what the hell? Why are you canning this guy? It seems like he's doing well. But it doesn't seem like he's got control of the locker room anymore. They're well under 500. If they don't pull it together sometime soon, the season's gone. I mean, if you go through November and you're that far behind, yeah, everyone's going to say, oh, St. Louis Blues. And a few years ago, Ottawa went on a huge run to get into the playoffs. But the odds are against you. The probabilities and the math don't lie. Well... How much of the fault can actually fall on Mike Babcock here? We know he's a great coach. You know, he's a Stanley Cup winning coach. He has always walked into teams and brought them success. I'm looking at the situation. It's got to fall on the players. This is a group of players that they're highly skilled, they're highly talented, and they just haven't delivered that in the way that they should. I probably would have played out the season with Babcock, maybe made some trades, maybe some minor moves to shake up the lineup. But I honestly don't think that the blame should have fell squarely on his head. Oh, I don't think so either. I I rarely think it's the coach's fault. Now, I do believe that a breath of fresh air, new scenery for the players can jumpstart. So there is that. It's not his fault. I mean, the players have just not performed. They've had some untimely injuries with Marner going out, but the writings were on the wall. They were not playing well. And like I said, I think the the Maple Leafs still believe they can make the playoffs, so I think they want that jump start now, see how it goes. But either way, he's gone. Yeah. He's lost the locker room. It's, you know, this new age of player doesn't respond to authority very well. I mean, if you look back a number of years ago, you know, Scotty Bowman coached till the guy was like, 75 years old he never ever lost control of a locker room different players i get it that's a guy that went through his career with success the entire time babcock has had his day he will get hired somewhere else but he is an old school guy maybe these guys just don't want to hear that i don't really share this opinion but i have heard just from several people that they think that Mike Babcock is severely overrated, that he's always walked into a team that was on the cusp of success anyway. From his time in Anaheim to Detroit, he never really had to take a team from the ground and build it up. Now, there is some validity to that, but I still think he's one of the top three coaches in the league, and he absolutely will land somewhere else. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, there is some argument. His decade in Detroit, obviously, he had a huge foundation there and was primed for success. Uh, Anaheim really hadn't had a string of of success. I mean, they did have Timu Solani, Paul Correa, J.S. Jaguar was just coming up. So, I mean, he did have some pieces there. But when he came into Toronto the first year of his tenure there, 
they didn't have Austin Matthews. They didn't have Mitch Marner. So he was brought in to kind of build the foundation. Now, fortuitously, they drafted these guys and they came right into the NHL. I don't think he was brought into Toronto to, you know, with a, a plethora of resources to work with. That that all fell into place afterwards. Babcock, he, he has had some success, but he's also had some downfalls. I mean, he only won one cup with with Detroit and they had a crazy team there so you know you go back to uh, his days as the head coach of Team Canada he did win two gold medals and that's that's a that's a huge accomplishment I mean there's very few coaches out there that have ever ever stepped into that now he had super teams to work with there's no doubt about it but uh, either way he's moving on he'll find a job somewhere else but just building on that I mean there's a number of other coaches out there that are on the hot seat and right here in Calgary Calgary started off, you know, middle of the road, but they are borderline messed right They're now. They're terrible. They cannot They're do terrible. anything. They scored a couple goals against Colorado the other day, still lost. Ending made it that, close. What was the shutout streak on that? It was like 170 minutes or it something was, like that? It was at it least was seven straight periods. That's terrible. Uh, Johnny has lost himself. The, the core has lost themselves. Even Kachuk is, seems like he's a little bit useless right now. I, I've never been that impressed with Bill Peters. He's another guy that sounds like Mike Babcock. So, you know, he preaches these things that need to be done, and the players aren't responding. So uh, I think it's actually time for Calgary to consider just axing him as well because they're on the, the cusp of already missing the playoffs. Well, and he's a guy that I think, as opposed to Babcock and trying to wait it out, I do think it would probably be beneficial for Calgary to ax Peters as soon as possible and move on. I never thought he was that great of coach, not in Carolina. Uh, he did have, obviously, last season with the Flames that did, where he did really well, but uh, he just doesn't have the pedigree there. And if you look at the results right now, like you just can't ride this out any longer. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I guarantee you we're going to see a trade of some kind. They're already floating around. I think it's Jankowski uh, who's one of the targets. He's not going to net you much because he's just... He's got zero points. Zero points on the fourth line. Like I don't know what they're expecting to get out of return. But looking at it from an outside view, they have to do something because they're just not pulling it together at all. Bill Peters was instrumental in getting some of the key players that we have now, like Lindholm. Uh, Hannafin came over as well. Uh, but we lost Dougie Hamilton, and Dougie Hamilton turned his career around. He's an absolute beast over there in Carolina now. Not from a physicality standpoint, but he's just mounting the points. But the Flames find themselves in the Johnny Gaudreau era. They make the playoffs, miss the playoffs. I mean, this will be the third year in six years that they miss it. And it's always they have a banger year, and then it seems like teams figure them out. They take a, a bit of a road bump or a, you know a hiatus, and then uh, they come back. Now, and in those six years, every other year they've switched coaches. Two years under Hartley, two years under Gullickson. This is the second year with Peters. It just seems like a bit of a trend. You know, the goaltending's been okay. They just can't score. Who do you replace him with, though, if you let Mike him go? Mike Babcock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's you know, me being facetious, but, you know, maybe maybe the Flames do explore that. I mean, Babcock probably wants to take a bit of time. He's still got $18 million coming from the Leafs and guaranteed money. Does he care? Would he want to step back in, you know? I would be hesitant to replace one veteran coach with another, though, with these authoritarian uh, type personalities. To me, looking at the Flames, it might even be more beneficial to bring up somebody from the NA- her AHL or uh, get one of the younger guys that are floating around. I don't even know who's available at this point. Somebody call the maniac Jim Playfair. <laughs> yeah, Jim Playfair. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in all honesty, though, the Flames need a kickstart. I don't know what the answer is, but they, they're drowning right now. And they got to turn it around in the next couple weeks or we can just be watching leisurely hockey that doesn't mean anything another coach on the hot seat john hines from the devils i would expect his days are absolutely numbered Um, i know we've been talking about that team a little bit throughout the past couple episodes because i am a fan they are one of the most underachieving teams in the league right now Uh, with all the young allegedly superstar players that they have they should be a lot better than they are 
And I think a lot of those problems, you know, were in net with Corey Schneider, who just got demoted to the AHL, likely ending his NHL career. But they're just too far down in a hole right now. I I think their season's borderline over, oh, and it's over. gonna, you know, Taylor Hall's not gonna want to be there anymore. Uh, it's crazy. I mean, two years ago he won the MVP, and they were a playoff team, and their the team hasn't fundamentally changed all that much. So it is. As a fan yourself, it's got to be frustrating to see. I mean, I looked at the record. It's not overly bad because they lose a lot of games in overtime. So they're in games, but they're just not getting, you know, that push to get over the hump. Yeah, the season's looking pretty close to over. I think Ottawa's even overtaken them in the standings. That's... And they're a team, actually, that's on the rise. Yes. Like, they are playing pretty darn well. And one thing I will throw out there as a statistical anomaly, if you look at the leaders in the NHL in the plus rating uh, category, Pajot is leading the league on one of the league's worst teams. How is that possible? And by, like, six points. Really? Yeah. That I, I looked at that. I was like, that is insane. He's... Just based on that, not even looking at his points, he's on the ice for a lot of goals. He must not be on the ice for a lot of goals against. So he's having a, a standout year. Where are they playing him on that team? Is he one of the top two lines? <sighs> I would assume so if he's getting the minutes. Maybe he's just not a minute cruncher, though. But uh, I, I can't speak to a lot of his statistics. I just saw that, and that stood out to me. Wow, unbelievable. Uh, Ottawa is a team that absolutely needs it too, because that franchise has just been through so much over the last, you know, five years, however long it was before they, after they made that run, uh, between all the, uh, the the inner team drama and the owner Eugene Melnick being an absolute psychopath, and uh, it's seemingly everyone on that team wanting to leave town, like they need a boost. Well, they're like the league's lowest attendance right now, and I think it's really driven by Eugene Melnick. the The town is basically boycotting uh the team based on him now like i don't know if this is even possible but when does the nhl step in and say you got to sell this thing yeah like i mean you're a billionaire so like this is a rounding error for you but like when does that happen because this team is going into the tanker now the players are actually you know i think they're tuning that out they don't care about the attendance they're still putting their best foot forward and considering their roster they're doing very very well and i think they've won something like six out of eight or something like that so they're uh and they just won the other night against the canadians last night in overtime another canadians, team that's on the rise yeah too, like, so i mean who knew ottawa it's 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 weird but th- there's fans there it, they've proven it they've 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 been a pretty successful team uh, when Eric Carlson was there, but now it just seems like the bottom dweller of the league in terms of you know the community interest. Another thing to keep in mind about Ottawa, uh, I actually work with a guy from that city uh, at the Sun, and he was saying that a lot of it could have to do with I mean not only the the team being poor for for so long and the owner, but apparently the stadium's really hard to get to, and it's just you know, way on the outskirts. He likened it to uh, Spruce Meadows here in terms of distance and just trouble trying to get to. So that's also something to keep in mind. Well, that is, that that's a real thing. That, that, that was one of the big factors of why the Expos in the MLB didn't have great attendance. It was the Olympic Stadium was in the middle of nowhere. I know this from going to a lot of Phoenix or Arizona Coyotes games. If that hockey rink was in, you know, downtown Phoenix or somewhere a little more central, I think they'd have a little more interest in people going to the games but it's all the way out in glendale which is out in the boonies basically uh they have the football stadium right there but people will go anywhere for football especially in the u.s 100%. but the hockey arena yeah that it, the proximity does matter just to circle back around to the devils for one more point on Corey Schneider, because again, I do think this is... You just love to re- just reek on that guy. Well, no, I, I just <laughs> occurred to me when this happened and, he, and he, when he got the banishment, have you ever seen such promise from a player who finally got a chance to start but completely crumbled? Like, I can't remember a faster fall in recent memory. Uh, Cam Talbot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. 
when the <laughs> Oilers made the playoffs, I think it was 2016, 2017, for that season, I remember all the Edmonton writers uh, calling him an elite goaltender. An elite goaltender along the lines of Pecorine and Carey Price and Henrik Lundqvist, who I still think are probably the three best, maybe not so much as they were then. They were calling Cam Talbot the new guy in that group, if you can believe it. Well, it, he, he he followed a similar path to Corey Schneider, actually. You know, Schneider benefited from Luongo's injuries back in the day and got a lot of playing time and looked good on a good team. But Cam Talbot's career started in New York, and Henrik Lundqvist had a long-term injury uh, the year before he went to the Oilers and made the playoffs. And he stepped in in a backup role for a number of weeks, and he stood on his head. He looked great. You know, he went to the Oilers, had that one anomaly year, and now he's almost in obscurity. He another, You know, I said the goaltending's been good for the Flames. Cam Talbot, I mean, he's getting fed to the Wolves. I, I'm not saying it's all his fault, but he hasn't looked very good. So he's falling from grace as well. Well, and he's not that old either, too. I think he's still in his early 30s, which makes it even worse and sad. Another sad point from the Ottawa Senators, it, it appears that uh, Bobby Ryan the once uh, very valuable forward for the Anaheim Ducks and at least valuable to the Senators in his first couple of years there. It sounds like he's entered the NHL uh, NHLPA substance abuse program. Now, I don't think they mentioned that specifically. Well, it's actually called the Player Assistance Player Program. Assistance program um, but And we can only speculate here, but there's been writings on the wall that Bobby Ryan's been struggling with something for a long time. Uh, he's, he, you know, speaking of falling from grace, he was the former number two overall pick behind Sidney Crosby, That's if you can believe crazy, it, yeah. uh, of the Ducks. And his tenure with the Ducks was very promising. I think he had a couple 30-goal years. Uh, one specific memory comes into play when the Ducks played the Predators in the playoffs. He had one of the prettiest goals I've ever seen in my life to this day. But as soon as he left the Ducks, he signed a big, big deal with the Ottawa Senators. And ever since then, and that was in 2013, believe it or not, uh, it's been a you know consistent downward uh, trend for him. And it's very sad, and I hope all the best for him. I read up on him, and it sounds like he's had a pretty tough go of it you know, his whole life. So that you know, that, those are the things that kind of lead into substance abuse or whatever it is, mental illness. He's trying to cope. But I wish the best for him. I, I hope to see him in the NHL again. You have to wonder, because I don't know if he's been dealing with this the whole time, and if he is, feel really bad for the guy. But or was it a cause of getting to Ottawa and losing that superstar status and getting demoted to the fourth line that caused all that stuff? Because again, outside of that first season with them, he really didn't get the chance after that. He's been riding out uh, bottom six minutes and uh, getting benched pretty much the rest of the time he's been there, which again, you're right, that could definitely cause some stuff to, to spiral out of control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think we want to leave it at that, but I mean, it is... It is unfortunate. It is something that everyone's aware of, and it doesn't happen every day. Uh, and I know men- mental illness is something that our society is putting a lot of focus on lately, and uh, openness, and you know, people helping, and you know, it's okay to ask for help. And I'm glad that he's finally, you know, gone that route. And let's get some help. And hockey's secondary. I mean, you got a life to lead. You're not going to play hockey forever, so. He's got kids, a family. He's made off pretty well in terms of his salaries the last, well, the last decade. Uh, so I wish the best for Bobby Ryan. I hope he comes back. Speaking of the NHLPA, they are appealing the Dustin Bufflin suspension, this really nasty drama that's getting out of control with Winnipeg Jets. I just found out today that the suspension was without pay. They are essentially, uh, from what I understand, and this could be wrong because there's a lot of lingo and jargon to go in there, but they're essentially freezing his contract and he's not able to collect any pay from there, um, which the NHLPA are claiming is not something that can go down whatsoever. Well, I, I I applaud the Players Association. I mean, you, you have to have that back and forth. I mean, you got the owners and then you got the Players Association and you need both sides to keep each other honest. And if the owners are trying to do something that they're not supposed to do, like garnering wages uh, when they're not allowed to, you know, via the CBA, uh, they should be held accountable. I, I applaud the Players Association, Association for going after them. I don't know the ins and outs of all the Bu- Dustin Bufflin drama, uh, but if he is entitled to pay, he should be paid. Now explain something to me here, because I've never really understood this, because it's pretty much written on the wall that he's going to retire, right? Like he's done. 
He's absolutely done. Now, if he were to retire, does that mean he would still collect the earnings owed from the team? Or that would just be he's done, sever the contract, and then that's it. No more earnings. Er, earnings. I don't really understand how that works. Yeah, retiring basically voids the contract. I mean, if you're injured, that's one thing. You're still part of the deal. But if you're retiring, you're basically saying it's like any employment. If you're saying you're retiring, you're done. Like that, 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 that severs the contract. And that's why you see some guys, they'll retire, come back in a year and they go sign with somebody else. Retirement does complicate things, but it does open the doors for someone that may want to look somewhere else, you know, take a year off or whatever. There can be those, you know, my industry, it's called a non-compete. I can't compete for business that I've had in the past. You cannot play for another year. So there are those, those ins and outs. Now, with Gronkowski, it's interesting because there's still a bit of chatter. I don't yeah, think it's going to happen. But, you know, Robert Kraft, it's speculated that he, he wants Gronk to come back for the playoff run. You know, if you come back to the same team, they may just open the doors and let you do it. But uh, if you're going to look somewhere else, you might have a, a waiting period. Well, because I think Bufflin right now was supposed to be on long-term injured reserve. And I think players at that point still collect what they're owed. So, like... Uh, Mark Savard was a guy who was on it for a long time. David Clarkson was another one who I think might still be on there. Nathan Horton, there's another it's name. It's still cap hit. Yeah, still a cap hit. So th- does that mean if they're on L uh, long term the entire time, they're still collecting the paycheck, just riding it out? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Yep. And, and it's different from sport to sport because there's what's called guaranteed money. Uh, in the NFL, the rules are a bit different. You can basically cut someone at any time, and a lot of their contract is voided at that point. But that's why you, the the trend now is to say, okay, I got a $100 million contract. Well, who gives a shit? What's the guaranteed money? Because you could play a year, get hurt, and they'll cut you, and you're the, they're absolved of anything. The NFL is weird that way. One last point on the NHL. Don Cherry just got his own podcast. He did not wait long uh, his show will be called The Grapevine shortly after his uh, dismissal from Coach's Corner, and it does sound like that entire segment is wiped out now, uh, even though replacements are still being speculated, but it sounds like the entire show is done. What surprises me about this is, A, I'm just shocked that Don Cherry even knows what a podcast is, but B, there's going to be lots more people that listen to that than this, and I can't even imagine somebody sitting down and taking an hour out of their day to listen to an hour's worth of Grapes Ramble. <laughs> well, contrary to what we be- what we feel about Don Cherry, that he does have his supporters. So strike while the iron's hot. The podcast might fizzle over time, but I, I guarantee you for the next couple of months, there will be listeners because he does have his supporters out there. You know, I think the people that have gotten him into it, you're right, he probably doesn't know what a podcast is or, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But there's people that are behind him that are probably pushing him to do this because, like I said, pub- no publicity is bad publicity. I mean, and that rings true all the time. So why not just get in there while everyone's still talking about you and see if you can build something? What's curious to me is that what is this podcast going to be? Like, is he still going to analyze current games? Is he just going to talk about the situation and his career and what led to getting him to where he is now? Or is he going to tell stories from his career and like revisit on all the highlights and, and tell all the hidden gems that might be in an autobiography? Because I think if he did the latter, it would be a hit. And I might even listen to something like that because like, as much as I don't like the guy, he's seen it all. And I bet he's got some really cool stories that nobody's ever heard before. Absolutely, man. I mean, he goes back. He's the coach of the Boston Bruins when Bobby Orr was there. So... Like, the guy's got a plethora of stories. He's still super active in the junior hockey space. I mean, if you want to pick someone's brain about the next prospect, it's Don Cherry you want to ask. Because he is the one that, he he knows these kids from when they're 12, 13 years old. He follows all these people. He knew about Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid before any of this hit the, the, the TV screen or before they even started junior hockey. So he does have a wealth of knowledge. And like you said, last week you know you kind of started losing respect for Don Cherry when he stopped talking about hockey or hockey exclusively I mean if he refocuses and gets back into what made him great uh you know this podcast could be a hit and like you said if if he got down to these stories I think you'd be interested I'd be interested so uh you know kudos to him I don't believe in what he said or, you know, the the track record the last five years, but he's free to do what he wants, and I hope success for him. He's a human being, uh, and he deserves respect, even though I don't agree with him. All 
All right, we're moving on to the NBA. Uh, you want to spearhead this one? I know you want to talk about the Warriors. Let, let's do this. I, I do, and I've dropped this nugget on the on the podcast before, but it's starting to really materialize for me. Um, you know, the the Warriors aren't necessarily tanking because they have had some horrendous injuries. They started the season with Clay Thompson on the bench basically for the year. Steph Curry's. Uh, hand injury seems to be pretty severe, for, at least from what we're hearing. Draymond's in and out of the lineup. Uh, left with old uh, D'Angelo Russell running the ship, and he dropped 52 the other day. Uh, but they they won a game yesterday, they so did. they're tied for last place in the in the NBA. Uh, but if this trend continues, and I think management would be wise to kind of, you know, if Curry is available, really make him sporadically available sit him for as long as possible to get him 100% because when Clay comes back next year, Steph's healthy, Draymond's healthy, and they get a top five pick in the draft and then go trade D'Angelo Russell and his max contract to someone that has max contract space and get some pieces for that to replenish the bench. I think Golden State, if this all kind of comes together, like the Tim Duncan scenario in the, the late 90s with the Spurs, we could see another really long run from the Golden State Warriors if they stay stay healthy. With Steph Curry, uh, I was thinking about this the other day, he doesn't really seem like the kind of guy, like, say, if he's ready to go or he thinks he's ready to go, and the Warriors are like, oh, well, no, well, we kind of have this plan, you know, man. <laughs> Steph Curry doesn't really seem like the guy to really agree with that and be like, oh, oh, I see what you're doing. You're taking to get a first overall pick, uh, and you're trying to hold me out. Uh, to me, he seems like the guy to be like, uh, no, fuck that. I'm playing for sure. Yeah, and I'm not saying they're they're quote unquote tanking. I think they should just be very cautious because what's the point about putting Steph Curry into a losing situation, re-aggravating the injury or causing another injury? Uh, I, I I get what you're saying. Steph Curry's going to play if he thinks he can play and he's cleared medically. I don't think that's what I what what I think is going to happen. I think that if the hand injury is significant enough that he should sit. There's no point in putting you out there. If they're competing for first place or this is a playoff push, that's a different story. Sometimes you make a little concessions, you're borderline ready to go. But in this particular situation, the Warriors aren't going to recover from this this year. And they never were quite frankly. No. I thought they might be okay, but Clay was a huge hit. He's He's been healthy almost his whole career. Huge contributor. His defense is underrated. He's a core part of that team. Their bench is gone from the, the last few years, and that was part of the magic of the Warriors, is that they could just come at you with like nine players. It's a different dynamic. They started behind the eight ball this year, so I think just be cautious, but even if Steph comes back, they're not going to win a lot of games. They're just not, they just don't have a good nucleus. So I just think there's, they're going to miss the playoffs. They're going to finish pretty low. And, you know, the sky's the limit for them after that. You get a lottery pick or the first overall pick. I mean, and trade D'Angelo Russell, like I said, for a boatload of bench players and maybe some draft picks there too. Man, it, it's, it boggles my mind how, what, what could, the Warriors be next year. Do we know who the next hot prospect out of the NCAA is going into this next draft? Well, it's interesting you say that. I uh, I don't know. Uh, it's always hard to tell, and at least until January, February, when there's a you know a, at least ten to fifteen games played in the NCAA. Uh, but I did read a story here out of Memphis, the Memphis Tigers, their top prospect who, and I can't remember his name, I wish I did, but he's averaging 17 points, 10 boards a game, real stud. He's been banned for 12 games by the NCAA because Penny Hardaway, the coach of the Memphis Tigers, apparently paid his mom about $11,000, which is a real no-no in the NCAA. So he's actually being punished for that. Paid his mom $11,000 for what? maybe to influence him to go to Memphis. <laughs> oh my um, God. <laughs> either way, it looks like they're being ordered to repay that money and he's going to sit and that might affect his draft status. And he is projected to go above, you know, the top five. That's wild. You always hear of these strange stories coming out of both NCAA football and basketball with these weird backdoor corruption scenarios. Eh? It's just like any, unlike anything else in any other sport. Well, I mean, the NCAA, it's, 
I mean, they like to be the police of everything, but there's no way they can track everything. And they'd be kidding themselves if this isn't rampant. You know, like a guy like John Calipari, who always gets a starting lineup of McDonald's All-Americans at Kentucky. If they don't think that's happening or they can't prove it, doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. And to pick on these guys, like I've always been an advocate, they should be getting some form of payment. They're making these colleges and universities a lot of money. And $11,000, like, give me a break. Like, these guys are coming from nothing and... This guy could have went to Kentucky. He could have gone to Duke, you know, all the big name schools, but he chose to go to Memphis. Maybe the money had a bit to do with it, but Memphis, you are benefiting in NCAA. You're benefiting even more. Speaking of uh, highly touted NCAA draft picks, Zion Williamson, not looking too good. Well, we always kind of knew he's going to be out long term, but I, I, I just look at him and, you know, these guys that are freakish athletes, sometimes their bodies don't agree with what they're doing. And I, I hope a speedy recovery. I hope nothing happens and he comes in and blows the league away like he's supposed to. Supposed to. He, he looks like a freak. <laughs> New Orleans could really use him. They suck. <laughs> yes, uh, and they, they may do. suck <laughs> with him too, but he needs the experience. But, you know, going back to, I was bringing this up with you, uh, his days at Duke, he was a highly touted guy and ripping up the NCAA. And uh, he had that Nike shoe rip incident where he wrecked it. Well, he was out for about six weeks with, with an ailing knee injury. I just hope this isn't the writings on the wall of someone that just continually gets injured and the career goes nowhere. Dude, it would be such a waste. He was supposed to be the next generational guy, you know, which you don't see often in the NBA. Uh, before that, it was LeBron. And before that, it was Kobe. You know, like Zion was supposed to be that guy. The NBA would be so much worse off if this is this is it and he just can't get over the injuries and it's over before it even begins. Yeah, well, I think it's a little premature to say it's over, but I just, it's, it's a bit of an alarming trend because the guy is pretty young uh, and hopefully he rebounds, but I just... You know, just to speculate, you know, you do see these things from time to time where a guy gets chronic injuries and the guy really goes nowhere. But let's try to keep it positive. It's something to talk about, but it it doesn't look like a good trend. And like I said, I hope he gets back as soon as possible because New Orleans really needs to start building that rebuild right now. On the other end of the spectrum, Luka Doncic from the Dallas Mavericks, absolutely tearing up the league right now. Uh, breaking all kinds of records and looking like the hottest thing in the NBA. He is his his ability to be to get a triple double. He's a multifaceted guy. He's a motivator. Dallas bringing in Porzingis last year. He's still kind of feeling it out, getting his legs back under him after a year and a half out of the league. But Dallas, I think, is a huge up and comer. Uh, I did watch the Raptors Dallas game the other day, and Raptors kept him under wraps for a lot of the game. He blew up in the fourth, and the Raptors lost. So he's a game changer, and it's awesome to see because he's he's a playmaker, rebounder, motivator, young. Dallas looks like they're in good shape. Yeah, it's interesting too because you don't really hear tons about the Mavericks in terms of up and coming potential or being a team on the rise. It definitely seems like they're flying under the radar. Uh, just in terms of of putting together their identity right now. Well, the West and the NBA is funny because, you know, we were speculating about this kind of preseason beginning of the year. If you look at the West, four teams that made the playoffs last year are out of the playoffs. You got new blood in there like Dallas. Phoenix is finally starting to come together. I love Devin Booker. The Timberwolves, they started off hot. They're still in the eighth seed. And, uh, you know, it's crazy to see. Like we talked about the Portland Trailblazers last week, Mello. But uh, they still haven't pulled it together, and that's sad because they made the Western Final last year. But, you know, the Lakers are up uh, up at the top, and it, I just love seeing that new blood because the West has been a little stagnant. It's the same teams in there every year. Uh, Denver broke that mold last year with their young roster, and they're continuing that trend because they're, they're in the number two seed right now. Doncic, he's a stud. <laughs> couple football points to touch on not much like i said we're going to keep it light uh Le'Veon bell from the jets uh ripping into the nfl for receiving i think it was like 
something stupid. Uh, Ten random HDH steroid tests within the last couple months. He went on Twitter the other day and just took him to task. And he's like, I'm not doing any more of these. I know what you guys are doing. Uh, you have it out for me. And it sounds like rightly so. <laughs> well, I, I didn't realize it was for, you know, PEDs. Uh, but the guy did have a suspension for weed and whoop de doo yeah, shocker, That's the yeah, NFL whatever. thing. Apparently, LeGarrette Blunt, you know, funny last name <laughs> yeah. given circumstances. Uh, he, both those guys got suspended. But I think Le'Veon, that put hit, put him on the hit list. You know, you, the NFL is notorious for that. I mean, look at Josh Gordon. The guy was getting drug tested all the time because he couldn't put down the joint. You know, there's an argument that the NFL should drop that policy. I mean, weed's being legalized almost everywhere. everywhere. It's, it's an aid for mental health, uh, those types of things. Uh, but Le'Veon shouldn't be surprised. And if he's not doing anything, who cares? You know, it's in- interesting about the weed thing. I just read, uh, it was a statement from Daniel Carcillo once the uh, uh, Don Cherry thing happened. You remember Daniel Carcillo, St- Stanley do. Cup winner. You know, yeah. he was a bit of a, a bottle rocket on the ice, kind of an agitator. I uh, loved him, man. He could score once in a while and he beat the fuck out of you, too. Yeah, 100%. So it turns out what he's doing now, he's like a big advocate for cannabis, right? So that's kind of where he's taken his career in terms of using it for mental health, in terms of using it for body pains and all that kind of stuff. And he had come out uh, after the Cherry thing and just like pretty much confirmed the. Uh, I hate using the term, but the toxic masculinity among the hockey crowds and and locker rooms and that kind of stuff. Um, But just moving on to the point is that uh, with all of these benefits that you're getting from weed, like it's and and cannabis use and CBD use and stuff like that, it really is shocking that the major sports leagues aren't just letting it you know fall away because we're entering a new era. And if it's helping more people than it hurts, then yes, let it happen for sure. The thing about it that I don't quite understand, and I know there's a, and this goes back a long time. I mean, there's there's definitely a perception of weed as being kind of a gateway drug, which is BS. But I, it's an old school mentality. But the at the end of the day, it's not a performance enhancing drug. Exactly, it, it just isn't. So if it does give aid and it's not enhancing their performance, like what is the issue? You know what I mean? Like, 100%. I get it. If, if it made him a 10 times better hockey player, yeah, you should probably not let him do it. But it's um, it's not making him better. It's just making his head better. So it, we're going to have to get the old school out of there before anything changes. But uh, we are entering a new era. It will come. And we've got the Grey Cup coming up on Sunday in Calgary. It's going to be a party everywhere. Are you going? It wouldn't shock me if you're going. I No, I'm not going. <laughs> I was considering it if the Stamps made it, but they obviously didn't. Um, kudos to the Blue Bombers. They have pulled it together in uh, the face of adversity midway through the season when Matt Nichols went down. Uh, Zach Caleros has looked awesome unreal as a leader and inspiration alongside his mate as second quarterback strevens who they run in there for a couple options teams just come together and they absolutely shut down the riders as well as the stamps before that so they look like they're a team of destiny but hamilton's a pretty good team i would say if jeremiah masoli was in there i'd say no question the hamilton tiger Cats were going to win but i think it's, it's the cfl and it's it's a toss-up man i i really don't know what to expect well it, it's good for both teams because neither of them have won a great cup for a very very long time since the 90s yeah exactly so uh good on both cities i will say just looking at it from a picks perspective i do think hamilton's gonna win and i do think it's gonna be a bit of a blowout but i my heart kind of wants the bombers to win just with uh, caleros being there i think it would be the better story uh, in terms of his redemption and getting traded multiple times, uh, you, you you just can't write that kind of stuff into good movies, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. You could make a 30 for 30 about that if ESPN focused on the CFL. Which they don't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll disagree with you. I think it's going to be a pro-line tie. It's going to be within a, wow, a field right. goal. Uh, I think it's not going to be high scoring. It should be pretty good weather for everybody, though, which is which is a positive. Take the weather out of there as a, a consideration. 
But I think it just it, I, it's going to come down to who has the the better start, because in the CFL the games can go on and on and on. But I think if you get if you get off to a hot start, you can probably ride that to a victory. So wait, just to set it clear, uh, you're taking the bomber. You know, my heart's the bombers. My head is telling me the Tiger. Same Cats. thing with me. Yeah. Uh, I want the uh, bombers to win though. <laughs> Anyways, thanks a lot for listening again, guys. Really fun episode to record. Lots of fun stuff, a couple negatives, but all in all, we love doing this, so we hope you guys continue to listen. Hopefully, we get some more platforms out there in terms of what we can put this out on. But in the meantime, we'll see you next week, and don't be a dick on the internet.